All right, let's pray. Father, your word is a precious truth. It's, it is so valuable. And we have tasted in your word and we know that you are good. But Father, we want to know you more. We, not, we want to know the reality of your love for us in Christ more. Father, we want to walk in obedience to Christ more faithfully. And so Father, I ask that as we look at your word, that your word would do its powerful work in our hearts today. Help me, Father, to be faithful to your word, to have a heart that seeks to honor and exalt Jesus Christ. And Father, I ask that you would help us to see the wonder of the freedom that there is in Jesus Christ. So bless our time. May Christ be exalted, and may you do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. We praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today is, uh, or this weekend is Independence Weekend. Yesterday was Independence Day, and it was 244 years ago yesterday that the 13 colonies, that they drafted the Declaration of Independence. And in the Declaration of Independence, they declared that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, after that, the most sizable portion of the Declaration of Independence is offenses that they are tabulating against the king of Great Britain for his tyranny. They list things like his refusal to pass laws of benefit to the colonists, appointing judges on his will alone and not with the consent of the colonists, keeping standing armies in America without the consent of the colonists, cutting off America's trade, imposing taxes without consent, refusing to protect them, and even waging war upon the colonists. And the, the colonists, they weren't anarchists. This were, it wasn't just the, the common people uprising. These are the leaders of the colonies that had gathered together. And they said in the Declaration of Independence that they had made numerous appeals to the King of Great Britain, appealing again and again, please, this isn't just, please, this isn't right, please, we don't have freedom here. But he did not hear their pleas. And so the Declaration of Independence concludes saying, these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown. And that was the beginning of our nation, the United States of America. They were seeking freedom, freedom from the oppression of a tyrannical government. And, and brothers and sisters, despite the many faults in our land, uh, especially on this weekend when we're remembering our independence and celebrating that as a nation, we should be grateful for God, to God for our heritage as well as the many blessings that we do have. God has been very kind to our nation over the centuries. But we hear a lot about freedom today, don't we? Almost every controversial issue today is crafted in terms of freedom. So the right for an abortion to kill our babies is talked about in terms of reproductive freedom. The right to have no restrictions on our, our uh, sexual actions is called sexual autonomy. The Libertarian Party, part of their platform is decriminalizing prostitution so that two consenting adults can have freedom to do whatever they want. Opposition to male uh, leadership is called uh, smashing the patriarchy. And young people rebelling against their parents, they do so because they want freedom. Almost anywhere you look, uh, we're, we're ca categorizing things in terms of freedom, our desire for freedom. But brothers and sisters, what is freedom? Is it, as is commonly thought, the right to do whatever you want as long as it doesn't hurt someone else? That's the common definition of freedom, the right to do whatever you want, want as long as it doesn't hurt someone else. Is that what freedom is? Well, that's a very common definition of freedom today, but according to scripture and in our text, we see that that definition of freedom is deadly. It's not freedom, it's actually slavery. In order for us to understand what freedom is, we need to first understand what true slavery is. We can't understand true freedom without understanding true slavery. And in order for us to be free, truly free, 
That can never come from within ourselves, but it can only come from Jesus Christ. Jesus says in our passage, if the Son sets you free, then you are free indeed. So in our passage, let's see four truths about the nature of true freedom as well as true slavery and why true freedom is found in Jesus alone. So you can think of this as a, a true independence sermon, a true independence weekend sermon. So here's the first truth. True freedom is found in abiding in the words of Jesus. So Jesus, he's still in Jerusalem at the Feast of Tabernacles. He has been preaching the gospel, the gospel of his free grace. And as he's been preaching, we see in verse 30 that many believed in him. Many believed in him. And in our passage, verse 31, we see that Jesus is addressing those who have believed in him. So Jesus is a faithful Lord. He cares for those who have turned to him. He's not going to leave them to their self, themselves. And so what we see in our passage is Jesus addressing these believers to teach them and to instruct them in what it means to be a true disciple. And what we see and what Jesus says is the nature and blessing of a true disciple. So notice first the nature of a true disciple. Verse 32 says, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. Well, how can you know that you are a true follower of Jesus Christ? How can you know that you're a true disciple of Jesus Christ? Jesus says, if you abide in my word. The word to abide, it means to remain or to stay. So this is not a, a hearing Jesus' teachings once or hearing Jesus' teachings for a short period of time and, and then moving on and forsaking Jesus' teachings. This is a continuing in Jesus' teachings, a holding to his teachings. This is someone who is prizing Jesus' teachings, seeking to understand Jesus' teachings, and walking in obedience to Jesus' teachings. That's what a true disciple is. That's what distinguishes a true disciple from a false professor of faith, one who abides in Jesus' teachings. Matthew Henry says, A disciple is one who dwells in Christ's word as a man does at his home, which is his center and rest and refuge. For us as followers of Jesus Christ, our home, you might put it, is the teachings of Jesus. We're resting in there. That's our center. That's a, we're, we're orbiting around our home. That's our shelter, is the words of Jesus. And this is the consistent message of the New Testament. A true disciple of Jesus is one who abides in the words of Jesus. Turn to 2 John verse 9. We'll go to a couple other passages to see this message. Look at 2 John 9. 2 John is at the, toward the very end of the Bible. Revelation, going backwards, Jude, 3 John, and 2 John. 2 John verse 9 says, Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teachings of Jesus does not have God. Whoever abides in the teachings has both the Son and the Father. So you don't abide in the words of Jesus, then you don't have a true faith. But if you do, then that is, that is a characteristic of a genuine faith in Christ. John 15, 4 through 5. Go to John 15, 4 through 5. This is the passage about uh, Jesus being the vine and we being the branches. And look how Jesus describes what true faith is in John 15, 4 through 5. It says, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. The way we have fruit, the way we produce fruit and show ourselves to be Jesus' disciple, it's by abiding in the vine. By abiding in the words of Jesus, by resting in the words of Jesus. And then look at John 5, 37 through 38. Here Jesus is speaking to those who don't have true faith. And look at what he says. John 5, 37 through 38. And the Father who sent me has himself borne witness about me. His voice you have never seen, his form you have never heard, and you do not have his word abiding in you. For you do not believe the one whom he sent. 
What's proof that they don't believe? They don't have the words of Jesus abiding in them. The words of the Father, the words of the Son. So, a true believer is not one who makes a mere profession of faith. A true disciple of Jesus is one who is abiding in the words of Jesus. Now, Jesus is addressing who? He's addressing believers, those who have believed in him. And he's saying, here's the nature of true faith, of saving faith. It's those who abide in my words. Well, what's Jesus talking about? Why is he saying this to believers, those who believed in him? Well, as this passage goes along, we see that these people, verse 37, they don't have the words of Jesus abiding in him. Verse 44, we see that God's not their father, but their father is the devil. And then in verse 59, this passage ends with these believers picking up rocks to throw at Jesus. So they believe, verse 30 and 31, but as we see, it's not a true faith. And this is something we've seen again and again in John. John speaks of those who believe in Jesus, there's a kind of faith but it's not a genuine faith. It's not a faith that is abiding in the words of Jesus and is continuing in the words of Jesus. So just a couple of examples. John 3, Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night. He says, you're a teacher from God. No one can do these works unless God is with him. It's a kind of faith. And Jesus says, unless one is born again, born from above, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. So Nicodemus still doesn't have true faith. In John 6, with the feeding of the 5,000, the crowd, when they have this uh, amazing miracle happen, they say, this is the prophet who's ascended to the world. And they want to make him king by force. And the next day, they travel miles searching for Jesus, and they finally find him. And Jesus talks about him being the bread of life, and those that uh, come to him must eat of him by faith. And when they hear these hard words, what do they do? They leave. They get offended and they leave. They don't have a genuine faith. And so in John 8, Jesus is speaking to those who believe. They have an interest in him. They have a high view of Jesus. But they aren't abiding in Jesus' words. They don't have a saving faith in Jesus. Brothers and sisters, a Christian is not a mere professor of the faith. A Christian is one who perseveres in the faith. The seed that fell in the rocky soil and the thorny soil in Jesus' parable, it, it sprang up, but the weeds choked out some of the seed, the rocks, it didn't have deep roots, and so it, it was burnt. They didn't produce fruit. And that's not genuine faith. There is a reception of the word of God, isn't there? But it's not abiding. It's not persevering in the faith. The true faith is the seed that falls on the good soil, that bears fruit with patience, Jesus says, some 30, 60, and 100 fold. So we should not think of a loved one who made a profession of faith a long time ago. May we led them in prayer. And they, and they cry out to God and said, God, save me. God, be merciful to me. Jesus, come into my heart. We should not think of them as having a true faith if now for years and years and years they have not been abiding in the words of Jesus. They haven't been receiving the words of Jesus. They haven't been continuing the words of Jesus. That's not a true faith, Jesus says. Many begin the Christian life with an appearance of faith. Judas and Demas and Simon the magician, they have an appearance of faith. But they don't persevere in the faith. But a true disciple of Jesus is one who abides in the words of Jesus and who perseveres. D.A. Carson says, a genuine believer remains in Jesus' word, his teaching. Such a person obeys it, seeks to understand it, and finds it more precious, more controlling, precisely when other forces flatly oppose it. So that's the nature of a true disciple. Look now at the blessings of a disciple. Jesus says in verse 32, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. If you abide in Jesus' words, you're going to know the truth. And that makes sense. After all, Jesus is truth incarnate. And as you come to know the truth, 
The result is glorious. The result is you're made free. You're made free as you abide in Jesus' words and know the truth. From any and all kinds of bondage, no matter how great, Jesus can set you free. And with a freedom that's not temporary, but with a freedom that is everlasting. What this means is that following Jesus is not enslaving or restrictive. That's what our world says. To follow Jesus is to be confined, to be restricted. But that's not what the Bible says. To follow Jesus is to experience true freedom. And that freedom is only found in Jesus. This is the clear testimony of God's word that freedom is found in Jesus and in Jesus alone. Just listen to the testimony of scripture here. Galatians 5.1. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit to a yoke of slavery. Romans 8, 2 through 4. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. 1 Corinthians 7, 22 through 24. For he who was called in the Lord as a bondservant is a freedman of the Lord. 2 Corinthians 3, 17. Now the Lord is the spirit and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is what? There's freedom. Freedom is found in Jesus Christ. True, abiding, lasting freedom is found in the Son of God. Well, what's the nature of this freedom? What is this freedom like? Well, to understand that, we need to understand the nature of our slavery. And that's what we see in the next two truths here. So the next truth is this. True slavery is fundamentally being a slave to sin. It's fundamentally being a slave to sin. Now, when the G Jews hear Jesus' word here about being set free, they are offended. Because what is Jesus implying? You will be set free? That implies you're slaves. So they say in verse 33, they answered him, we're offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Now, I don't think what they're talking about is a political slavery because that's so patently false. You can almost not think of a time where they weren't enslaved. They were slaves in Egypt. They were slaves to their enemies, their foes during the time of the judges often. They were slaves when they were led into exile by Babylon and captivity. And even right now, they're under the dominion of Rome. I don't think they're thinking about political slavery. I think they're thinking about a religious slavery because they say, we're offspring of Abraham. We've never been enslaved to anyone. I think they're saying, we're sons of Abraham. To us belongs the promises and the covenants and the adoption of, as sons. We're freedmen. We are children of God, Jesus. We've never been slaves. But Jesus doesn't back down. They're offended. But Jesus doesn't water down the truth. Instead, what he says, verse 34, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. So they think of slavery only in terms of religious heritage, but Jesus says, no, true slavery is a slavery to sin. Everyone who practices sin, and I think that's a good translation, your translation might have everyone who commits sin, or your translation might have everyone who sins. But the word here in Greek, it's a present tense participle. It's literally the one doing sin. And with it being present tense, it's speaking of an ongoing action. And this is what scripture talks about repeatedly, is those who are born of God don't make a practice of sinning. We see this in 1 John 3. But those who are not born of God do make a practice of sinning. So it, practicing sinning, doing sinning, is someone who is giving themselves over to sin. They're habitually practicing sin. They're enslaved by that sin. They're under the dominion of that sin. Everyone who practices sin, Jesus says, is a slave to sin. Well, how is that person a slave? I think at least in two ways. First, in the dominion of sin. The dominion of sin. You practice sin apart from God's grace because the desires and the lusts and the passions of sin control you. You do sin because you want to do sin. 
The desires of sin are your master, and as a slave, you obey your master's command. You might hate the destruction and the hopelessness that sin brings, but your love for sin prevents you from leaving it and from disobeying its commands. Listen to 2 Peter 2, 18 through 19. This is speaking of false teachers, and it speaks of the enslaving reality of sin. For speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice by sensual passions of the flesh those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. They promise true freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. So did you hear the definition there of slavery to sin? If you're overcome by something, you are enslaved to it, Peter says. For whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. And you think of someone like King Herod and how he was enslaved to the fear of man. John the Baptist had been preaching against his, his incest. He had taken his brother Philip's wife Herodias for himself. And uh, John the Baptist said, it's not lawful for you to do that. It is wrong for you to take your brother's wife. So Herod had him arrested. But he didn't want to kill him because he feared John the Baptist. He knew he was a righteous man. And what's striking is he doesn't fear God, so he doesn't leave his sin, but he does fear John the Baptist, and so he won't put him to death. Well, Herodias absolutely hated John the Baptist, hated his message, and so Herodias has her daughter uh, give a sensual, uh, perverse dance before Herod. And Herod is in, in a kind of drunken stupor, uh, after the dance is done, he promises up to half his kingdom to this woman. And she goes and talks to her mother and comes back and says, I want the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the text says, because Herod feared his guests, he executed John the Baptist. But it doesn't end there either. After John the Baptist is put to death, Jesus starts performing miracles. He's beginning his ministry. And his fame starts to grow and to spread. And people are wondering, who is this? But Herod says, that must be John the Baptist, whom I beheaded. Whatever he does, he's living in the grips of the fear of man. Fear of John the Baptist when he's alive, fear of John the Baptist when he's dead. Fear of his guests, fear of his wife that he's taken, living in the grips of the fear of man. Whatever he does or didn't do, it's controlled by an appeasement and approvement, approval of other people. And this is how we all are apart from God's grace. We are enslaved to sin because we're overcome by its power. It could be sexual desires that we are enslaved to, that we keep going back to again and again and again. It could be pleasures. It could be envy, a feeling of unhappiness at the blessings of other people. It could be malice, coveting, wanting other things, never satisfied, uh, always craving more and more and more. It could be pride, greed. To practice sin is to be under its domination. So that's one way that we can be in enslaved to sin is the domination. Another way that we are enslaved to sin is by its damnation. It's damnation. The wages of sin is death. And the one who practices sin is not free, no matter how he feels, because the judgment of God is upon him. Now, if you knew that if you killed someone, that you would certainly be tried, you couldn't escape, you'd certainly be arrested, you'd be tried, you'd be convicted, and you'd be sentenced to death, but you went ahead and killed that person anyway, would it be freedom that you're walking in? No, that sentence is upon you. You're under its judgment. You're not free when you're walking in that sin. We're enslaved to the sentence of judgment. And this is the reality of all of us apart from God's grace. We're living a life in sin, and God's judgment weighs upon us, and we can do nothing to escape from it. Romans 6, 15 through 16 says, What then? Are we to sin because we're not under law but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one to whom you obey, either of sin which leads to death? 
Slaves of sin, which leads to death. So true slavery, it's not a religious slavery, a religious heritage like the, the Jews here think. True slavery is a slavery to sin. Under its domination and under its damnation. Well, look at the third truth here. A slave does not have an abiding place in God's house, but only a son. Jesus goes on to talk more about slavery. He says, verse 35, the slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So they've been boasting in their heritage. They say, we're Abraham's offspring. We belong to the covenant. But Jesus warns them that it's not a slave that remains in the house forever. It's, it's only the son. The slave is not the heir, it's the son that is the heir. And I think Jesus is, is probably thinking of Ishmael and Isaac. Do you remember Ishmael and Isaac? They're both born of Abraham. They're boasting that they're sons of Abraham. Ishmael and Isaac are both sons of Abraham, but Ishmael is born of the slave woman, Hagar. And, uh, and, and Isaac is born of Abraham's wife, Sarah. Scripture tells us that Isaac was a son of the promise and Ishmael was a son of the flesh. Isaac trusted in the one true God and he was the son of promise. And Scripture tells us in Galatians 4.30, it says, Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. It's going back to Genesis, I think it's 21, of uh, Sarah saying that to Abram, cast out the free woman and God agrees with, or uh, cast out the slave woman and her son and God agrees with Sarah. So Ishmael was cast out. He, he wasn't the heir. Isaac was the son of promise and he was the one that would remain in the house. So do you see what Jesus is saying here? They're saying, we're Abraham's offspring. We're the true descendants of Abraham. And, uh, and, and Jesus says, no, it, it's not a based upon your physical lineage because a physical line of Abraham doesn't necessarily mean that they are a son of Abraham. You need to be made a true son of Abraham. You can't be a slave like Ishmael. Ishmael was a slave and he was cast out. And Jesus has said, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. He's saying, you're under the bondage of, of, of sin. You're a slave. Therefore, you will not remain in the house forever. You'll not remi remain in God's house forever. Listen to how Jesus explains to them that they're not a son. Verses 37 and 38. I know that you're offspring of Abraham. So yes, physically you're offspring of Abraham. Yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. I speak of what I've seen with my father, and you do what you have heard from your father. So they might be literal sons of Abraham, but they're not true sons of Abraham. Well, why is that? Because the word of the son of the father finds no place in them. Therefore, they are not a son. They are a slave, and a slave will not remain in God's house forever. They need to be made free. And brothers and sisters, this is a warning for us who have our confidence in our religious heritage. We say, my, my mother was a Christian, my father was a Christian, my grandparents were a Christian. Maybe you say, my, my father was a pastor, or my ancestors were missionaries. Well, certainly I'm a son of God. I, I, went, to, I went to church growing up. I went to Sunday school. I was baptized. That's my religious heritage. Certainly I'm a son of God. But Jesus would say, it's not according to the flesh. If you are enslaved to sin, then you're a slave. And a slave does not remain in God's house forever. You need to be made a son through the work of the Son of God. Only a son, a true son of God, remains forever. Well, now here's the fourth and final truth, and it's, it's, uh, it's glorious. The freedom that Jesus gives is truly a free and complete freedom. So we've seen that abiding in Jesus' words will result in you knowing the truth and you'll be set free. True slavery is a slavery to sin. A slave does not remain in God's house forever, but only the son. So what does it mean if God sent his only son and through his atoning work set captives free? What would that mean? 
it would mean that you are truly free. Look at verse 36. So, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. The only solution to our slavery for sin is to be set free by the Son of God. He alone has the power to free captives from their bondage. And if He sets you free, then you are free indeed. Well, how so? You might ask, well, how has Jesus set me free? Let me share with you three ways. First, you are free from the condemnation of sin. You're free from the condemnation of sin. Our sin incurred a debt so great that we could never pay. A condemnation hung over our heads that would crush us. But Jesus, by his obedient life and his sacrificial death on the cross for sinners, has more than enough paid the necessary price for justice. And through faith in Christ, you are justified. You are forgiven of your sins and you are declared righteous. That, that bond of sin, that debt of sin has been completely and fully and once for all paid for through the work of Jesus Christ. That debt is now canceled in him. Listen to Romans 8, 1 through 4. It says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those of us in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. We're under the condemnation of sin, but if someone uniquely qualified is condemned in our place, and by faith in him, his work becomes, uh, we, we become uh, beneficiaries of his work. Now there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So in Christ, you are free from the condemnation of sin. You're also free from the power of sin. Jesus' work as a redeemer isn't just to free you from the uh, damnation of sin, but also the dominion of sin. No longer must you practice sin. You are now empowered through the work of Jesus and his spirit, to walk in obedience to him. Jesus, and we heard this in the, in the passage I just read, uh, the passage continues to say, Jesus condemns sin in the flesh, he condemns sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. We might walk in obedience to the law. But how do we do that? Jesus, uh, Paul says, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So sin is canceled at the cross. Its debt is paid once for all when Christ was, he, when he condemned sin in the flesh in order that we might walk in obedience, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. This is the miracle of sanctification, becoming more like Jesus Christ. As we abide in the words of Jesus, we have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit of God who empowers us to say no to worldly lusts, no to those passions that once enslaved us. We're able to have self-control, and we're able to say yes to godliness. We say no to ungodliness and worldly lusts, and we say yes to righteousness and to holiness. And the third way that we're freed is from the alienation of sin. The alienation of sin. Sin alienates us. Remember, if you practice sin, you're enslaved to sin. Slaves don't abide in God's house, so we need to be made a son. But Jesus, as the Son of God, he has the authority to adopt us into God's family as sons. Galatians 3, 5 through, uh, Galatians 3, 25 through 26. Galatians 3, 25 through 26 says, But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. Through faith in Jesus Christ, the moment you first believe, you are adopted into God's family as a son. Now, sisters, you might be thinking, well, aren't I a daughter? Why does it say you're, you're, you become sons? For you're all, uh, let me read it again. For in Christ Jesus, you're all sons of God through faith. So why does it say sons and daughters? Well, there is a sense, of course, in which you are a daughter of God, but in a legal sense, and this is really important, 
in a legal sense, you are a son. And that's good news. That is actually good news. And here's why. It's the son who is the heir. The son is the heir. So if you are adopted into God's family by faith in Christ and made a son in the legal sense, what that means is that you are an heir with Christ. You're not second rate. You're not second class in the family of God's sisters. You are a joint heir with Christ. Legally, you are a son of God. You have all the privileges and blessings and love of being a son of God. So this is the freedom that we enjoy in Christ Jesus. The condemnation is gone. Christ canceled it at the cross. The dominion of sin has been broken decisively at the cross, and its effect is being slowly removed from us through the sanctifying work of the Spirit. And the alienation that we had, being a slave of sin, is gone as well, because we're now adopted into the family of God as sons, as joint heirs of Christ. So brothers and sisters, on this Independence Weekend, let us celebrate the true freedom that we have. It's not political freedom, although praise God for the political freedom we have. It's the true freedom that comes in Jesus Christ. True freedom is not the liberty to do what you want. That's what the world says. Uh, that's what true freedom is. But true freedom is the ability to do what you want to do and to be able to do what you should do all while enjoying the pardon and favor of God. Let me repeat that. True freedom is wanting to do and being able to do what you should do, all while enjoying the pardon and favor of God. That's true freedom, and that can only come in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. So Father in heaven, we give you thanks on this Independence Weekend that by your grace that we have been set free. Father, help us to realize the amazing miracle that that is and the incredible love that you showed for us. Father, some of us no doubt are, are dealing with guilt that we have and we feel like we're under your condemnation, but I pray, Father, that you'd help us to realize that we have freedom in Christ. There's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. And Father, we, we wrestle with sin. But I pray that we would realize that we are free from the dominion of sin. That we no longer have to practice unrighteousness. We're empowered by your spirit to walk in holiness. And Father, I pray that we would realize the incredible grace that we're no longer alienated from you outside of your house as a slave. But we are adopted and welcomed and loved as a son. We praise you, Father, and we praise in Jesus' name. Amen.